don't know whether you realize this or not, but the Bible is much more a part of our everyday vernacular than we realize. There are a lot of sayings that are popular today, things that we just say in common conversation that actually are brought from the Bible. Let me give you some examples. From Isaiah 40, verse 15, we get the phrase, a drop in the bucket. Matthew 12, 25 is where we get the phrase, where Lincoln got the phrase, a house divided against itself cannot stand. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, we get the phrase, a wolf in sheep's clothing. In John chapter 8, verse 7, we get the phrase that is often used, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Matthew 5, 13, we're told about the salt of the earth. And this morning, we're going to look at a couple of uh, phrases that come out of this text. Your days are numbered, you have been weighed on the scales and found waiting, wanting, and the handwriting on the wall. The Bible is rich with images that really resonate in our society. Now, we need to understand something as we go into Daniel chapter 5. There has been some time that has passed here. In Daniel chapter 4, we were talking about Nebuchadnezzar, and remember Nebuchadnezzar went crazy. And now, as we start to chapter 5, we read King Belshazzar. Who is King Belshazzar? Now, this is actually kind of a debated thing in scholarship, or it had been for a long time, because Belshazzar was not found in the records of Babylon. And according to this text, Belshazzar is the last king of Babylon. You see that at the very end, that the empires actually change in one verse at the end of this chapter. However, archaeology has shown that there was a guy by the name of Nabonidus who was actually married to Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, who had a son by the name of Belshazzar. And for a period, they reigned together. And so we're going to see later that he, Daniel is offered the third highest position in the kingdom. You know why it's the third highest position? Because there was Nabonidus, there was Belshazzar, and then there would be Daniel. So this guy has been verified historically. Now we know that the Persian Empire is growing, and it is certainly coming close to Babylon, and it begs the question, if you know that the Persians are coming, why are you having a party? But that says something about the arrogance of this Belshazzar guy. He really felt that Babylon was impenetrable. There was no way anybody was going to get into Babylon. We are safe. Let's just have a party. Then we see his arrogance and what he does here. He calls for the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. Now, that's not a good thing. So the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. They brought in the gold goblets that has been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. And then they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. This is a direct affront to the nature of God. This is an attack against him. And uh, think about this. Um, there's this movie called The Sandlot. It's a baseball movie. These kids uh, get together and they play baseball. But in the story, this one kid, his, his dad, I think it was, had this baseball that was signed by Babe Ruth. Now, any of you know anything about baseball, even if you don't know much about baseball, you would know that a ball signed by Babe Ruth, very valuable. Well, one day they needed a ball to play ball with, so he took that ball and took it out to the sand lot, and it ends up getting hit into this junkyard, and this dog slobbers all over, and it's just disgusting. Put yourself in that position. If that was your baseball, would you be upset that your kid took it out and played with it? Yeah. Would you be upset that he basically destroyed it? Yeah, you would. Now, magnify that by many times, and you get the feeling of how God felt when Belshazzar treated the objects that were in the temple in Jerusalem in this 
manner of disregard. Let's just bring that out. Let's just use it as our common dinnerware, and we're going to have a party. And not only do they drink from it, but they drink from it in a service of idolatry. And so this guy is just thumbing his nose at God. Then in verse 5, we read these great words. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. Now I'm thinking these are big fingers, you know, in the big hand. And, they, and we are actually told that it's on the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace, as if we had actually visited there and would know where that was. The king watched the hand as it wrote. I bet the king wasn't the only one watching the hand. And then, I love the understatement of scripture. His face turned pale. He was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. You think? It spooked me out a little bit, too. He basically passed out when he saw this. And this was God's way of getting this Yahoo's attention here. And he was uh, freaked out. And so now he calls in his uh, interpreters. And he brings these in. <laughs> I don't know what group these guys are. Every time we see them in the book of Daniel, they don't have any answers to any of the questions. But he brings them in. He says, I need you guys to interpret what this hand wrote on the wall. And they got nothing. They don't have any idea what this is about. And then we're told that the uh, queen, let's see, verse, uh, whatever that is there, verse 10, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came to the banquet hall. And that's interesting. The queen hearing the voices, because earlier we we're told that the wives and the concubines of Belshazzar are already at the party. So who's this queen lady? The thought is that it may actually still have been Nebuchadnezzar's wife, which would have been Belshazzar's grandma, or it could have been his mom, Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. But either way, my picture here is that she was having tea, watching, you know, her soap opera or something, and, and in the background she hears all this screaming, and I'm guessing that this Belshazzar is cussing. You know, he's saying to these wise guys, what good are you guys? Why are we paying you guys? You never have answers to the questions that we need for him. What in the world is going on? And she hears this and she comes in and says, hey, 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 get a grip, man. What's the deal? What's all the shouting about? And then he tells her, oh, this hand came up and started writing on the wall. And I'm just, these guys are useless. I don't know what it means. And she says, hey, grow up. Grow up. If you were paying any attention at all when we were teaching you about your grandfather, then you would know that there was a guy in your kingdom by the name of Daniel who came from Jerusalem. This guy has a supernatural power. So he calls for Daniel. And, uh, and we're not sure how he responds to him. In verse uh, 13, we told, So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you... Daniel, one of the exiles, my father, the king, brought from Judah. Now, is he saying that in a, in a derogatory way? Are you Daniel, one of the exiles, my father brought from Jerusalem? Or is it just descriptive? I don't know. And then he says, I've heard that the spirit of the gods is in you. Is that derogatory or is that just stating the fact? I don't know. And then look at what he says. If you read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Now, if this was Barb Bean, she would say, if you're going to put purple on me, there's nothing you're going to get from me. She didn't like that. So, <laughs> right, Barb? It wouldn't work for you. However, for Daniel, what it meant was that you were going to be treated as royalty, and you would be made the third highest guy in the kingdom. We've talked about why it's the third highest guy. You'll be under me. So Daniel takes this guy to the woodshed. And he says some interesting things. The first thing he tells him is, look, you can keep your gifts. I don't need these gifts from you. I will tell you what this means. But not because of what I'm going to get from it. I'm going to tell you what it means because it's a message from God and I'm a servant. The second thing he says to him, if I can paraphrase a, a well-known vice president, presidential debate, he basically says to Belshazzar, 
Belshazzar, I knew Nebuchadnezzar. I worked with Nebuchadnezzar, and you are no Nebuchadnezzar. And he talks about Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, this guy was great. He had all kinds of power. He was wise. He provided for the people. Listen, you little pimp squeak. That's, that's in the Hebrew. Um, listen. <laughs> in my mind, that's what I heard. Listen, you little snot. Um, your, your grandfather was a good man. You're a punk. And then he says to him, you need to understand that the most high rules, whether you accept it or not. Your grandfather learned that the hard way. God took him out. God, God made him crazy for a while. But he, he admitted that God was supreme. You should learn from your grandfather. Your arrogance is what's causing you trouble. Now, stop here. Let's ask an application question. As you look at your life, are you more like Nebuchadnezzar, somebody who is learning from the events of life? Are you learning about God? Are you growing in your faith? Or are you like Belshazzar, who arrogantly continues to move forward and says, if God wants me, he's got to get on my train or forget it? Which is true of you? Well, hopefully, we're like Nebuchadnezzar, because what we're told here is the meaning of the message in verses 25 through 29. This is the inscription that was written, many, many, tekel parson. And then he tells us what this means. The many, M-E-N-E, -E, means God has numbered the days of your reign. Tekel, you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes Versions. Now, this is the vision. He says, here's what God is telling you. Your time is up, buddy. God's not happy with you, and he's going to destroy your kingdom and give it to the Persians. Who? They knew were coming. I find it strange what happens next. At Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Did you find that odd? Daniel has just said, listen, God's going to get you. He's going to wipe you out. He said, okay. Was that arrogance still? Saying, oh, you, you said this, you've answered the question. My curiosity has been satisfied, but I don't really care what happens now. Or I don't believe it. Or I'm going to save face and I'm going to act like there's no big deal. It's interesting, the chapter ends with the fulfillment. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede, we might know him as Cyrus, took over the kingdom at the age of 62. It's an interesting story. The Persians came upon Babylon. If you remember from last week, that one of the seven wonders of the world were the, the walls around Babylon that there was a double wall system that was so thick that you could get a chariot on top of the wall and you could turn around. <laughs> get chariot races up there. And so there was this sense in which nobody with a conventional army could ever get into Babylon. These Persians were smart. The Euphrates River ran right through the, uh, the city of Babylon. It was their water supply. So what the Persians did was they went up the the waterway a little bit, dammed the river, and walked in under the wall, on the riverbed. And they took the city without a fight. Why? <laughs> because all the leaders were drunk at a party. It's an interesting story. So we have this change of an empire described to us in just one verse. So the question is, Great story. Man, it's, it's a wonderful story. We now will know what handwriting on the wall refers to and um, all these things. But what are we supposed to learn from it? The first thing we need to see is that God defends his honor. I, I wonder sometimes why God endures with some people and not with others. Why, why does God let some people get away with things? I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I think there are some questions that 
you and I should ask? We should ask, are we justifying our sin or our unwise behavior by saying, well, we're, we're free in Christ. We can do whatever we want. Are we lazy in our pursuit of holiness because we have been forgiven? I've been forgiven. I don't have to worry about these things anymore. Do we justify demoting God and the priorities of our lives, presuming upon his compassion? And we say, well, God will understand. Have we made God an accomplice to our skewed priorities by saying things like, I'm sure that God would want me to fill in blank, put my family first, be successful in my job, be happy, enjoy what he has provided, whatever the case may be. We need to remember that we do not evaluate God, he evaluates us. God wants us to honor him and obey him and serve him. God wants us to treat him with respect. And when we do not do that, we are setting ourselves up for judgment. And why, like I said, why God endures with some people and not others, I don't know. But eventually, God will stand up and say, I'm not going to let you treat me like this anymore. So there's a warning there. Second, what we, I think, take from this passage is that we need to learn from history. The problem that Belshazzar had was that he wasn't paying attention to what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. If he had really applied the lessons, he would have learned that the God of Israel at least should not be messed with. That he should leave that God alone. Or maybe he would have learned that he should bow before this God who was sovereign over everything. I'm troubled, and, and I hope you are too, that as we look at our society, there seems to be this uh, prevailing notion that we, our generation, is more enlightened than anybody who's ever come before us. All the lessons of the past, the lessons of our founding fathers, the lessons of scripture, the things that those people have learned. We say, you know, that was fine back then, but we have advanced. We are more civilized than those people, and therefore, those lessons don't apply to us. We need to understand that sometimes that which is new and innovative and fresh is really just the disguise for that which is deceptive and foolish. I'm not saying that we need to never change, that we should never adapt our methods, but we shouldn't ignore the lessons of the past. And that's one of the things that Daniel basically said to this guy, look, the lessons are there, and that's why the Bible is timeless truth, and I commend you, you're here today listening to things that happened a long time ago, because you believe that these lessons, these truths, these accounts are written to instruct us and to teach us today. There's one more thing I want you to see here, though. And that is that, that this passage, you probably don't see it right off the bat, is a reminder of our need of God's grace. See, if you come away from here and you come away from these stories in Daniel, and your conclusion is this, I need to work harder, otherwise God's going to get me. That's the conclusion you're drawing, you're missing the point entirely. That's really not what this is about. This is about the fact that we are sinful people. We are way more like Belshazzar than we would like to admit. There are parts of us that are rebellious. There's parts of us that don't want to do what God wants us to do. We want to be our own person. We want God to follow our lead rather than us following his. We are like Belshazzar. We need help. We need forgiveness. We need a new beginning. Just like Belshazzar did. Just like Nebuchadnezzar did. Just like everybody does. There's a sense in which... Uh, you and I are desperate for somebody to help us. And God understands our hopeless situation. He has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. The whole idea of Jesus was that he came into the world, 
He showed us the way we're supposed to be lived. And then he gave his life as a payment for our sinfulness. When he rose from the dead, he proved that that debt was paid in full. The mistakes, the foolish choices, the, uh, the scars of our past can be forgiven in Christ. If we will turn to him, he will begin to live inside of us. He will erase the past from his sight, and in addition, he will make us brand new. The good news that we have to testify today is that the person that, that I used to be, the person you used to be, is gone. We have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer we who live, but it is Christ who lives in us. It's not about what we deserve. It's about escaping what we deserve. It's about finding grace midst of sinfulness. I can't help but wonder what would have happened if Belshazzar had taken a different different course? What would have what would have happened if Belshazzar had said, okay Daniel, you're right. I've been foolish. I've been playing with the God who is real and true and I shouldn't have <coughs> What if Belshazzar had said, please pray for me. Pray that God would forgive me for I repent in dust and ashes and I am sorry for the things that I've done and I don't know what else to do except to throw myself on the mercy of the God of the universe. What would have happened then? We'll never know. Because that's not the choice that Belshazzar made. His story is written Yours is not. Your story's begun. You're heading in a certain direction, and that direction may be disastrous. You may be uh, heading somewhere really, really bad. But the plot of your story can change dramatically in an instant. If you, this day, would instead of running from God, turn and say, I repent. I'm sorry. I'm tired of running away from you. I'm, try I'm tired of trying to get you to do what I want you to do. And instead, I bow before you. I recognize that you're in charge. You're the king. I need you to change me because I can't change myself. You can do that. The Bible says, Jesus says in the book of Revelation, he's talking to a church in Laodicea, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. That's the promise. Your life can change today. Your story can be rewritten. The, plots, the plot line can shift. And all you have to do is bow before him to run to him, to his open arms. To say, Lord, I'm going to stop running away from you. And I'm going to run to you. You can do that today. And I encourage you to do so. One of the things we've learned from Daniel is this. That we need to address these things while God is impressing them upon our heart. And I hope he's impressing these upon your heart today. Because if we don't do that, one of the things we've learned is that when we see the handwriting on the wall, it's often too late. Let's pray. Our Father, like Belshazzar, we are rebels at heart. We acknowledge, Lord, that apart from your mercy and your grace, we are lost forever. So today, we pray that you would change us, that you would wake us up, that you would help us to turn to you and trust ourselves to you, that we might find that forgiveness that is undeserved but is offered freely through Jesus Christ. Cleanse us. Help for people that we used to be to die so that we might live a new life. Set us free from the foolishness of our past that we might know the glory of the present and the hope of the future that's in Christ. For we ask all this in his name.